And let's uh, turn in our Bibles to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, and uh, we want to look here at verse 48. And this evening we just want to uh, spend a, a few minutes in the Word of God on uh, the subject of the forgiveness of sins and how we can know that our sins are uh, forgiven. Uh, Luke 7 and verse 48. Luke 7, verse 48. And he said... Okay, and one more time. Uh, Luke 7, verse 48, a very simple verse, but uh, let's read it together. And he said, Amen. You may be seated. And uh, uh, what we want to look at uh, this evening is just a few very basic verses in the Bible about the forgiveness of uh, uh, sins. Now, number one, the Bible is very, very clear that we can know that our sins are forgiven. That is something that uh, we can know. Uh, we can know that our sins are uh, forgiven. Just like here uh, in Luke 7 and verse 48, he said unto the woman, thy sins are forgiven. Now, so here is a woman and the Bible uh, previously in the story it mentions the fact that her sins were many. And even though her sins were many, we find that she was forgiven of her sins by uh, the Lord Jesus uh, Christ. So uh, the Bible teaches that I can know that my sins have been uh, forgiven. Now, a lot of times uh, people ask the question, can I know that my sins are forgiven? A lot of times someone might say, uh, nobody can know that, but obviously we see here in the Word of God with this woman that the Bible says that Jesus said to her, thy sins are uh, forgiven. Now, of all the messages in the Bible, the Bible teaches that this is the basic message of the Word of God is that we can know that our sins are forgiven. Now, in Luke 24 and verse 47, See, uh, the message of the Great Commission, Jesus said in Luke 24 and verse 47, he said there that uh, well, we're to go in all the world and preach uh, repentance and the remission of sins in all the world. So, see, uh, repentance and remission of sins is a basic message that Jesus said that his followers uh, were uh, to preach. So, uh, as uh, we all know this evening, I'm sure that this is one of the basic fundamental teachings of the Bible that I can know that my sins have been forgiven. Now, uh, in Mark chapter 2 and verse 10, Jesus said a very interesting thing there. He says, that, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Now, uh, it's very interesting. He has the authority to forgive sins. And uh, they said, that's blasphemy. They said, only God can forgive sins. And yet, uh, Jesus said very uh, uh, clearly that ye may know that the Son of Man have power or authority on earth to forgive sins. And if our sins are ever going to be forgiven, Obviously, they have to be forgiven by the Lord Jesus Christ. No man, no pastor, no priest, uh, but by the Lord Jesus Christ. Then the Bible is very, very clear that the basis of forgiveness in the Bible is the blood of Jesus Christ. It's not the church. It's not baptism. It's not giving money. It's not being good. If I'm good, God will forgive me of my sin. But the basis of all forgiveness in the Bible is certainly the blood of Christ. Now, when Jesus instituted the, uh, the Lord's Supper, uh, he uh, said to his disciples, say, when he picked up uh, uh, the cup, he said, uh, uh, this cup uh, reminds you, you see, that uh, this is my blood which is shed for many for the remission of sins, that, that his blood was going to be shed on the cross of Calvary, and it certainly was for the remission 
of sins. That's the only way Jesus said sins could be uh, forgiven was on the basis of the shedding his blood, uh, his blood on uh, uh, Calvary. And then in Hebrews chapter 9 and in verse 27, uh, 26, the Bible says he appeared once, say one time, the Bible says to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So that tells us why Hebrews 9, 26, why did Jesus Christ come into the world? The Bible says he came one time, he came into the world to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And, and that sacrifice was made on Calvary, and that is why our sins can be forgiven, because Jesus Christ died on the cross to forgive us of our sins. Now, uh, a lot of times people ask, where does the resurrection come in? And the Bible teaches that uh, he was crucified on the cross. He said it is finished on the cross. And then three days later, he rose from the dead. Now, the interesting thing there is that over and over again, he, t he prophesied and told his disciples that he was going to rise from the dead on the third day. Now, the interesting thing about that, see, we are not saved by the resurrection. We're saved on the basis of the blood. See, without the blood, there's no remission of sins. And so, see, the resurrection is God's verification that Jesus Christ died for our sins. Now, there are a lot of other things the Bible teaches about the resurrection. Uh, it's a guarantee of our resurrection. It's a guarantee that someday we'll go to be with the Lord in heaven. But the Bible teaches in Romans 4 and verse 25, he see, he, he uh, arose again. He was risen for our justification. That means that because our sins were, uh, he died for our sins, and how can we know that he died for our sins? And the resurrection is a great proof uh, uh, of that. Now, as we think of, of the cross, um, that's where Jesus Christ made the sacrifice to forgive us of our uh, sins. Now, number one, see, when you think about the cross and meditate upon the cross, which we don't do today. Say nobody meditates, thinks everybody's too busy. But uh, when uh, we think about the cross and the fact that uh, that was God's only way for us to be forgiven of our sin was on the basis of what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary. Now, uh, that reminds us of how horrible our sin must be in the sight of God. Amen? You see, uh, that, that, that God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, God who became a man, had to suffer the agony of Calvary in order to forgive us of our sin. And that reminds us again, uh, you see, how uh, extremely horrible sin is in the sight of of God. See, it is uh, wicked and rebel, uh, rebellion uh, in the sight of uh, God. Now, when we think about uh, Calvary, we see how wicked our sin is. See, why he had to suffer and bleed and die on the, the cross of Calvary. Now, and of course, on the cross, he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And uh, one of the interesting things about Calvary is that the spiritual suffering that Jesus Christ endured was uh, much more severe than the physical suffering that he endured. Now, when we read the epistles, we don't read a lot about any detailed account of his physical suffering. Now, even in the Gospels that tell us about how he died on the cross of Calvary, they don't go into a lot of the detail that they could have gone into in relation to the horror of the physical uh, death uh, and the things that surround it 
dying on Calvary. For instance, that uh, when somebody would die on the cross, I mean, it was a terrible thing. It was one of the most uh, uh, difficult, uh, excruciating ways that anybody could ever die is by nailing a, a live person to a cross and leaving him on the cross until uh, they, uh, they died. Now, uh, again, it was a very, very um, cruel thing. But I believe as we read the Word of God, see, the spiritual suffering of Jesus Christ. See, the Bible, I believe, teaches that, see, the Bible says our sin was laid upon Him. The Bible says He bore our sin. Christ died for our sin. So He paid the penalty for sin for every human being that would ever live. Anybody that wants Him uh, can be saved because he died that death on the cross of Calvary. Now, um, and again, the spiritual suffering was much more than the physical suffering on Calvary, because somehow on Calvary, Jesus Christ took upon himself the sin of the world. The Bible says he bore our sin. It was laid upon uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, see, and that shows us how much God really loves us. Now, as we study about the love of God in the Bible, see, it's not a Hollywood love, it's not a secular love, but like in Romans 5 in verse 8, see, God commendeth, God demonstrated His love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that's the love of God in the Bible, that Jesus Christ died for sinners over and over again. When we read about God's love in the Bible, it all goes back to Calvary and the cross. As Paul said, who loved me and gave himself for me. What's Paul talking about? On the cross of Calvary. Say, herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin. See, God's love was demonstrated on the cross of Calvary. And then, um, you see, the Bible teaches that the work of salvation, according to the Bible, was completely finished on the, uh, on the cross of Calvary. See, there's nothing that we can add to it. There's nothing that you and I can do to add to what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Someone might say, well, uh, don't I have to uh, confess my sins to a priest? Or don't I have to uh, uh, be baptized? Or certainly uh, I must pay some money. And there, there's some uh, gimmick there, or some, uh, something that I must do. And the Bible teaches that, say, salvation is free. Amen? Say, it's free. Uh, we're saved by grace through faith that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. See, it's God's gift. God's salvation is uh, free. It's the gift of God. The gift of God is eternal life. Many verses in the Bible along that line. Now, see, that tells us a lot about what salvation is all about. See, salvation is a finished work. It was finished by Jesus Christ on the cross. There's nothing that you can do, nothing I can do uh, to save uh, ourselves. And that is why salvation is free. See, He accomplished our salvation on the cross. He died, the Bible says, for our sins. He died to save us. And salvation is a free gift. Now, if we understand that, and by the way, a lot of people do not understand that. See, they think there's something I must do uh, uh, by myself, by way of works or whatever, in order uh, for me to be saved. See, and the Bible teaches that uh, there's nothing that you and I can ever do to add to what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary. That's why salvation is free. 
if I come to Jesus Christ as a repentant sinner, he will forgive me of my uh, uh, sin. But then uh, as we think of forgiveness in the Bible, the Bible uh, is uh, very uh, powerful and revolutionary in its teaching about uh, the forgiveness of sin. Now, you say, Pastor, what do you mean by that? See, the Bible gives us illustrations of people who were uh, forgiven. Now, and again, see, a lot of times someone might uh, uh, say, see, is God interested in me? Uh, many times uh, you talk to people and they say, I've messed up my life. I, uh, I know I've sinned against God. Uh, I've sinned against everybody. And I, I believe I'm worthless. And I don't think that God would really be interested in me. I've heard different people say that very thing where they said, uh, uh, I, I don't think God would be interested in me because I'm damaged goods. I'm a, uh, I lived a, evidently a, a very bad life or whatever, and I don't, I don't think God uh, would love me, and I don't think God would be interested in me. Then as we study the Bible, we find that God is interested in everybody. See, uh, God loves the world. God loves the world of sinners. God wants sinners to be saved. That's the heart of God, and that's the desire of God for people uh, to be saved. Now, I have a great illustration in the Bible uh, for someone that says, well, is God interested in me? Say, can God forgive me of my sins? Maybe he can forgive somebody else of their sin, but can he forgive me? And then we have that great illustration in the Old Testament about a man by the name of King David. And uh, when you study about King David, you find that King David was a, an adulterer. He committed adultery. Uh, sometimes people say, well, that's, all, that's where you leave it. No, then after he committed adultery, he murdered the husband of the woman that he committed adultery with. He had that, uh, that man, that general, one of his generals, say he had him murdered out on the battlefield. So, and that murder was attributed to David. See, the man that took the message, he knew. By the way, it's interesting to study about David. See, that man that took the message, later on he'll rebel against David, and he never had any respect for David. See, never ever did that, that general who took the message, because he, he read the message, saw it was in the message, and he knew exactly what it was. See, that you, you put Uriah on the front line where all the people are being killed. Put him up there, and then you'll guarantee that he'll be killed and murdered. And uh, so that general that took that message, very interesting when you study about David, he never again respected David, and ultimately he rebelled against King uh, David. And whatever David told him, it was like water off a of duck's back because he didn't have respect. Why? He knew that he was an adulterer and he was the one that caused the man uh, to be murdered. And then we find that David covered up his sin for at least a year. He lied on every turn. Uh, he lied to everybody for at least a year. Now, what we're talking about is the forgiveness of God that is found in the Word of God. Now, someone might say a sorry person like that who's an adulterer and a murderer and a liar and somebody that uh, covers up all his sin and is uh, the first-class hypocrite, does God love David? See, was David forgiven of his sin? And then we find very clearly in Psalm 51, that's the great psalm of David's repentance and confession of his sin and how he knew that his sins were forgiven. And then another Psalm 32, he said, Blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven. So there's a man who murdered, committed adultery, and uh, was a hypocrite and covered up his sin for a year, and yet God forgave David 
of his sin. Now, the reason why I bring that out, sometimes there are people that say, is God interested in me? Say, does God love me? Can God forgive me of my sin? And the Bible is very, very uh, uh, clear that if someone will repent and come to the Lord, they can be forgiven. And David is a great illustration of that. Now, uh, that's interesting. You might, might, someone might say, well, pastor, uh, that's the Old Testament. Uh, David was living under a different dispens uh, dispensation, uh, uh, so to speak. But turn in your Bible to Romans chapter 4. Now, in Romans chapter uh, 4, uh, we read here uh, about David. Now, now, this, say, we're bringing out on Sunday morning about giving in the New Testament. A lot of people preach about giving in the Old Testament, but the New Testament, as we saw this morning, say, it's filled with Bible teaching about giving and our responsibility to give and why we should give and uh, so forth. But now in the New Testament, in the book of Romans, and uh, we read here in verse uh, 5, the Bible says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth, say the ungodly. That's the only person God can justify is an ungodly person. A person who realizes they're a sinner and comes to him for salvation. His faith is counted, or say, put to his account, uh, you see, for righteousness. Now, verse 6 of Romans chapter 4, even as, and now Paul in Romans chapter 4 uses David as an example of somebody who was forgiven by God to let us know that anybody who wants forgiveness can find forgiveness, no matter what they have done. Now, you see what he says, even, uh, this is Romans 4 and verse six, uh, 6, even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. See, verse 7, Psalm 32, uh, saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are Forgiven, And what's the illustration that's given here in the Bible? That is David. That is a man who committed adultery, murder, and was a hypocrite and lied, and so forth. See, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven. And that's David's cry. Thank God. God forgave me of my uh, sin and whose sins are uh, covered. Now, now, you realize uh, what the story was. Uh, with David. You remember that Nathan came to David and, and David, uh, Nathan told him a parable and uh, then uh, Nathan, great prophet of God, he pointed his finger right in the face of David and he said, David, thou art the man. See, you have sinned in the sight of God and you need to repent of your sin. So God used David to bring him to repentance, uh, God, God used Nathan to bring David to repentance in his life. But that reminds us, see, uh, God is interested in everybody. See, uh, God is not turned off to somebody because they've sinned, because they've messed up. See, God wants to forgive. God wants to uh, restore. See, that's the God of the Bible. Say, the nature of God is to forgive. God wants to forgive. God longs to forgive. God is a forgiving God, but it all goes back to the cross of uh, Calvary. Now, uh, someone might uh, ask that question, well, what must I do then uh, in order to get this uh, blessed forgiveness that we read about in the Word of God? Now, Number one, of course, before anybody can be forgiven, the Bible is clear, I must realize I am a guilty sinner in the sight of God. Now, that's where a lot of people make the mistake. Almost everybody say, would say, I'm a sinner. Say, 
uh, and, and everybody here has heard people say, well, nobody's perfect. Everybody has sinned, you see. And, uh, but that's not what the Bible is talking about in relation to salvation. There's all the difference in the world in saying, I know I'm a sinner. And that's why we need to be very careful in dealing with people about salvation. See, it's not that I know I am a sinner, but I know I am a sinner and I am a guilty sinner in the sight of God. See, that's the point, that I have sinned not against my husband, not against my wife, not against my neighborhood or my friend. I've sinned against God. See, God is the one that I have sinned against. I am a sinner in the sight of a holy God. See, that's where we have to come to get God's forgiveness. Now, it's just not a matter of saying I've done wrong or I know I'm a sinner, but I am guilty in God's sight. I have broken God's law. Now, and uh, so that uh, a person must come to that point in order uh, to be saved. Now, uh, over and over again, the Bible says there's none righteous, but then it says, no, not one. It says not one person who is righteous in the sight of God. And the Bible says not even one, not one person can say, I am righteous in the sight of God. And that's why the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then uh, in 1 John 1, 9, the Bible says what? It says that if we say, we have the audacity to say, now that's even written to Christians, that we have not sinned, we're making God a liar. Somebody goes around and saying, uh, I don't sin or I haven't uh, sinned. They're making God a liar because God says we are all sinners. And then in order to be saved, a person not only needs to know they are a sinner in the sight of God, guilty in the sight of God, but they need to come to Jesus for forgiveness. Now, uh, there's no salvation without coming to Jesus. He, he, he requires that we come to him. Now, if we do not come to him, we'll never be forgiven of our sins. Now, in uh, Luke 5 and verse 32, there's that uh, familiar verse in the Bible where Jesus says, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, the interesting thing that we miss out a lot of times, as we mentioned Sunday morning, a lot of these verses in the Bible, we never really delve into them. And sometimes we miss out the most important part of the verse. But now, Jesus said, I came not, say, to call. You see, he's calling sinners to himself. See, he came to call. He's calling you. He's calling me. He's calling the sinner to come to him. See, he's calling. Now, what does that mean? He calls out and he wants you to respond to his call. That's salvation. Responding to the call. He's calling sinners to repentance, salvation. And it's my responsibility to respond to that call. Now, what he said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. And that's a call that goes out only to those who are sinners in need of salvation. But you see, if he calls, I'm required to respond to that call. And then in Luke 19, 10, the Bible says he came to seek and to save the lost. You know the story there with Zacchaeus. And in Luke 19, 10, Jesus said, I came to seek and to save the lost. Now, that's very powerful in the Word of God. What does that mean? In this world of confusion and bloodshed and uh, tragedy after tragedy, no matter whether it's in Ukraine or over there in Syria or in Ethiopia or down uh, in um, Haiti or uh, India, all types of atrocities going, going on in the world. But now, the Bible says, Jesus said, I came to seek. And what does that mean? See, Jesus Christ is seeking sinners to come to him. He's seeking the lost. Now, now he's seeking me. See, he's seeking you. By the way, I love that 
uh, that song that talks about uh, seeking for you. See, and that's why he came. Now, what does that mean? See, he's after sinners. He wants sinners to be saved. He is seeking sinners to be saved. That's what Jesus said of himself in Luke 19 and verse 10. Now, if he's seeking me, see, I have to respond to him. See, I have to say, yes, Lord, I, I know you're seeking me. You want me uh, to be saved. And then the Bible teaches crystal in a crystal clear way in 1 Timothy 1.15, Jesus said that uh, he, uh, Paul said, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's why he came. That's why he died, to save sinners. See, he wants to save sinners. Sinners, but the only person he can save is a sinner. And that is why he came to save us from our sin. By the way, that verse begins again. Tremendous verse that we neglect uh, some part of it. And uh, Paul begins that great verse by saying, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Now, what does he mean by that? And then he says, Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners. See what, what Paul is saying there. All of God's children know that is why Jesus Christ came into the world. That's a common saying amongst all the people of God, amongst all the churches, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. See, it's a faithful uh, saying, and worthy of all acceptation. That's the thing we need to uh, announce. That's the thing we need to preach. That's the thing we must tell people is that Christ Jesus came into the world to save uh, uh, sinners. But now, see, all of this leaves the decision with us. See, I have to make a decision to receive Jesus Christ as my Savior. Nobody can make that decision for me. A uh, mother can't make it for her children. A husband can't make it for his wife. Wife can't make it uh, for uh, her uh, husband. Say, uh, there are no grandchildren in God's family. If someone is saved, they are saved because, say, they have personally accepted Jesus Christ and his forgiveness of uh, their sin in a personal way that they can say, I know my sins are forgiven because Jesus Christ died for me and I trusted him as my Savior. Now, uh, probably the most common illustration of this uh, that's used probably in the, uh, commonly as we think about how I need to personally accept Jesus Christ as my Savior is that true story about George Wilson. Now, in 1829, George Wilson was a mail clerk uh, on the mail car on the railroad. And uh, they had these bags of money in that rail car that they would uh, deliver, evidently to banks and so forth. And uh, so George Wilson was in that uh, car with another uh, co-worker, and he had this plan. That, that he uh, would kill, murder his co-worker, and then he would tie his co-worker uh, uh, up, and then he would be tied up. He'd tie himself up, and uh, then it would look like somebody came on the, uh, the car, and they, uh, they stole the money and uh, got away uh, with the money. So anyway, uh, they, uh, the people examined George Wilson, and they, uh, he broke down, and he finally admitted that I murdered my coworker, and I was the one that stole that money. And he admitted to it, said I uh, murdered the coworker. This was my plan to uh, steal all this money and have enough money to uh, live the rest of my uh, life. Now, so in those days, back in 1829. Someone that did that, that murdered someone else, they would be executed at that time. And so George Wilson 
uh, was to be executed, and the president of the United States at that time was Andrew Jackson. And somehow through George Wilson's family pleading with them and uh, other, somehow some pressure was put upon President Andrew Jackson at that time, and they gave George Wilson a pardon and uh, actually issued a pardon to George Wilson. And it was a valid pardon. But the problem was that George Wilson said, I murdered a man and I deserve to die. I should be punished for my crime. And uh, I refuse the pardon. So this is very interesting in jurisprudence. That actually went to the Supreme Court of the United States of America. It went to the Supreme Court at that time. And the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court at that time was a man by the name of Marshall. And so they issued, and this is still on the law books today, uh, they issued uh, their decision. In this case, here is a man that admits that he committed the murder and did the crime, but he's issued a pardon by the United States, uh, the President of the United States, just like uh, presidents issue pardons or valid pardons. And, but he refused the pardon. So uh, they had to make the Supreme Court had to make the decision, and that was, um, is this a valid pardon or not? Is George Wilson to be executed, or is he not to be executed? And um, so they made that famous decision, and the decision was that, uh, that a pardon is written on a piece of paper to the man to whom it is issued. But if that man does not accept the pardon, that is not a valid pardon. It is not worth the paper. It is written on if that man refuses the pardon. And so the decision was that George Wilson must be executed. Now. The, and he was executed in Leavenworth, um, over there in uh, Leavenworth, Kansas. Say, and hung, he was executed. Now, the reason why George Wilson was executed, you might say, is because, according to the Supreme Court of the United States, say, uh, he rejected a valid pardon issued to him. He said, no, I do not want the pardon. I, uh, I will uh, be executed. And so the Supreme Court ruled that it was, if the person doesn't accept it, it's not a valid uh, a pardon. See, and he was executed because he refused to accept a valid pardon. Now, you see what I said? That's one of the great illustrations of Bible salvation. Amen? Say, Jesus Christ issues the pardon. He paid for that pardon in His own blood. Amen? Now, you see, He issues it to me, but it does not become valid in my life unless I accept it. And if I do not accept the pardon that He purchased for me on the cross of Calvary, See, uh, I cannot be forgiven of my sin. See, I must accept the pardon that he issued to me, and that's up to me. Now, he's calling, he's seeking, he came to save me, but I have to say yes to the forgiveness and the pardon that he accomplished for me on the cross of Calvary. Let's bow our heads and our hearts uh, in prayer. Now you see, Jesus Christ offers to you a full and valid pardon for all of your sins. But you see, you must accept the pardon. You see, um, and I wonder if there's someone here this evening, and you say, Pastor, uh, maybe I see it now, I understand it in a better way, I understand a little better about Bible uh, salvation. 
And uh, Pastor, I want to accept that pardon that Jesus Christ purchased for me on the cross of Calvary. I want that pardon. I realize I need to be forgiven of my sin. Yes, I want to come to Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads in uh, prayer. And as our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, <clears throat> is there <coughs> someone? And you'd say, yes, Pastor, I want the pardon that Jesus Christ offers to me. You say, it's too good to be true. You mean to tell me he offers a pardon of all my sin? You mean to tell me that he loves me so much he wants to forgive me of all my sin? And you say, Pastor, yes, I want the pardon that Jesus Christ offers to me. Is there anyone like that this evening? You say, Pastor, that's me. I know I am a guilty sinner in the sight of God. I do believe Jesus shed his blood, died for my sins. And I didn't realize how much he loves me, how much he wants to pardon, how much he wants to forgive me of all my sins. You say, Pastor, I want the forgiveness and the pardon that Jesus Christ died to purchase for me on the cross of Calvary. And if there's someone like that, would just raise your hand. We'd certainly like to remember you in prayer uh, this evening. You say, Pastor, I know I need to be forgiven. Pastor, I want to receive what Jesus Christ offers to me. And you're like that tonight. And you'd say, here's my hand. Would you, <clears throat> would you please pray for me? Pray that I would accept that forgiveness that Jesus Christ purchased for me on the cross. Just raise your hand and we'd like to remember you uh, in prayer. Our Father, we thank Thee again for Your blessings to us. We pray, Father, that You'd help us to understand uh, just in a little way we can never comprehend it in our um, human minds, our finite minds. But Lord, help us to understand in a better way God's great teaching in the Word of God about the forgiveness of sin through Jesus Christ. As he said to that woman whom even the people who knew her said she is guilty of many sins. And yet Jesus said, thy sins are forgiven. We thank thee for the forgiveness that Jesus Christ offers to us. And we pray in his name. Amen.